Hello and welcome to episode two of the Ireland on the Fly podcast with me, Dara Whelan. And on this week, we're going to take a step back slightly. Um, there's no news to report as of yet of the uh, first sound of the season to be caught here in Ireland. And uh, we're in the uh, 22nd of January. So we decided to take a step back and uh, bring you part one of a documentary that I made originally for WL or FM local radio. And it's about the story of the Blackwater Lodge. Uh, quite apt with the salmon season starting on the Blackwater on February 1st, so not long to go now. But this documentary looks at how the lodge was originally the old Ballyduff railway station, how important those railway stations were to rural Ireland in terms of linking people and commerce throughout the country. But then how then it developed into a salmon fishing lodge uh, and under the guidance of Ian Powell, uh, when he took it over in the 1980s and into the 90s and 2000s, it became one of Ireland's premier salmon fisheries. Ian talks to me about his dreams, his background, his past, and how he came to own the lodge and, and move to Ireland. We also hear about the importance of the railways in Irish history, and also speak to Glenda Powell in part two about her own fly fishing career. It's a documentary I hope you'll enjoy. It definitely takes a step back in terms of history and culture. I think it provides a fascinating insight into uh, how people get involved in fly fishing and how they live out their dreams and try and make it happen. So, hope you enjoy. When the Mallow to Rosslare railway line closed for good in 1967, many saw it as just progress. The stations were left empty and forgotten about. But 15 years later, Ian Powell, a Welshman who had never been to Ireland, had a dream. It involved a salmon fishery on the Blackwater River and a derelict railway station overlooking it. This is the story of the unique life of Ballyduff train station. first served local and rural communities for transport and commerce, before finding a remarkable second life as home to one of Ireland's premier salmon fisheries. However, just like the river, life moves on, and dreams don't last forever, as Ian Powell was to find out. And it's really a little bit like a dance. I always had this interest in fishing. Lift two, three, sweep two, three. It wasn't trying to make a fortune. I mean, basically, you make a living, not a fortune, when you do when you do something like this. Water cars, of course, were the big enemy of the railway. The river, she keeps on twisting and turning. The parish priest looked around at me and said, "Well, feck it." <laughs> Lift two, three, sweep two, three, shoot. Ian Powell, the Blackwater Lodge fishery owner, takes us on a tour of the building. That's the original sign that was there and it says passengers are requested to examine their tickets and change before leaving the counter as mistakes cannot afterwards be rectified. It's one of the most beautiful views that you could have anywhere in Ireland. I think looking down, it's green, you have the river meandering. The stone wall is part of what used to be Ballyduff Railway Station. If you go back to the 1960s, there was lovely old stone buildings and station master's house and what we call the freight shed out the back. It was all built from limestone, which was quarried 
in a quarry just down the bottom of the field because that's what they used to do everywhere. If they wanted to build something, they would just dig a hole in the ground, come down to bedrock, cut the stone, and away they go. And they 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 built this, and I mean, it is the most incredible stonework because you can't even put a quarter-inch masonry drill bit into the joints because the joints are that well done that there's there's just virtually no gap there whatsoever. And there was a door there. There was obviously a big door here as well. That was the ticket office, and that was where you you stood to get uh, to get your tickets. And there's still the remnants of the old ticket machine in the counters in inside there. This little room but through here used to be the ladies' waiting room and toilet and there was a fireplace in it. The waiting room where we're standing here had a fireplace in it as well. And if we go back out to where we were, this was the gents' toilet, uh, which uh, very appropriately was then converted into the keg store for the bath. <laughs> When you think back, the real heyday, I suppose, was around the end of the 1990s up to about 2000, and you could have anywhere up to about 50 people staying in the lodge. We had the restaurant and the bar, and the place was just absolutely humming. I was always uh, interested in fishing from the age of four. Uh, I was a coarse fisherman and uh, then I progressed on gradually to trout fishing and very quickly from there to sea trout fishing in Wales, which was a little bit surprising because my father had no interest in fishing whatsoever. So I came from a family that had no history at all of fishing. My father was deputy director of parks and leisure for Cardiff Corporation. And uh, there was a, a lake um, in Cardiff, not, not too far away from where we lived. And uh, that was under his wing as, uh, as parks and leisure. And my mother used to work as a uh, cashier on the boat stage where they used to rent out boats on the lake. So I would go, I mean, I was a good rower when I was very young um, and I loved going fishing and I used to drag my parents off uh, when we went on family holidays. Ian Powell, originally from Wales, fell in love with fishing from an early age. And although his life took many twists and turns, from being flown to France for work as an expert chemist to supporting Pink Floyd on stage, it all took him away from his home and the rivers he loved. And niggling in the back of his mind, he yearned to run a fishing hotel for people like himself. I always had this thing in my head about I wanted, I, you know, the fishing hotel was my ultimate goal, if you like. From Ballyduff Railway Station to the humming transport it became, these railway lines run through the blood of people like Oliver Doyle, a railway historian and retired railway clerk who followed in his own father's footsteps working on the mallow Rosslair line that served the upper Ballyduff Railway Station. The aim of the railways was to serve every town in the county. And they more or less succeeded. Very few parts of the country that didn't have a railway line. Oliver takes us back to the heyday of Irish train transport. The railway lines had very good traffic because there was really no competition. On the passenger side, uh, they, they had really wiped out by Ankeny and his um, horse-drawn carriages. And on the freight side... They had a, a total monopoly, apart from maybe one or two areas like along the Grand Canal or the Royal Canal or the Barrow Line, where traffic was still moving by a barge. 
The creation of railway transport in Ireland began only a decade later than that of Britain. And at its peak in 1920, Ireland had 3,500 miles serving communities in every corner of the country. The current status is less than half that amount. And Oliver tells of a time when travelling by train was at the height of its popularity. The greatest thing that drove the development of the railways was the postal service because they were now able to, to get mail from one end of the country to the other in perhaps 48 hours. One of the things that uh, the railways did help immensely was uh, in Dublin, where the colonial office uh, was for the, with the British administration, they ran an, a, a night train from London to Hollyhead. The boat across. And then they had the railway into Dublin to get the mails in in certainly less than 24 hours. The railway was an invaluable source transporting goods and services from one corner of the country to the other. The railway saw either to take traffic to the stations by way of perhaps coal, from some coal mines or uh, just uh, standard dry goods. But also in a place like Castletown Bear, they would have been collecting fish to take to the market in Cork. There was no refrigeration in those days, so taking fish from Castletown Bear to London or somewhere was not an option. Once railway systems became more regular and widespread, the population began using it for leisure. Travelling from place to place, visiting towns and cities that had not been possible before. Leisure travel really didn't come until after the first war. There were no airlines, of course, there was no competition. And if you wanted to get to Killarney cheaply and have a look at it and get back home, well then a day excursion on the train was the way to do it. And back then, people didn't bat an eyelid travelling 24 hours to get from Belfast to Killarney. People didn't bother about journey times in those days. Time wasn't as important as it is these days. And there was no alternative. There was no bus service that went any faster. As well as travelling to towns and cities for shopping or tourism, People also travelled to meandering rivers for a spot of fishing. The people wanted to go fishing on some of the important rivers, uh, like, say, the Blackwater or the Shannon, uh, then they could take the train close by. And they would either take a, a horse-drawn vehicle or walk to the location where the fishing was good. And many of these fishing trips began and ended at Ballyduff Railway Station. It was only after the re reopening of the Rossley Line in 1947 that uh, Ballyduff got a stop on the express, uh, the boat trains to and from Rossley. From its earliest days, the Ballyduff railway station took pride of place along the Blackwater River. They did uh, export some fish. Uh, from Dunmore East and from the Rosslair area, there was fish traffic to London Paddington. And they would collect all the fish uh, traffic for Billingsgate, and there was a railway line from Paddington into Billingsgate, and they'd just hook up the wagons to a small locomotive and take them into the market. because there was no refrigeration. In fact, the first refrigeration really that the railways got involved with in the south of Ireland was uh, bacon traffic from Waterford to London in the 1960s. And they put them, uh, the bacon was put into what they call refrigerated containers. They were colored white and they would put uh, dry ice with them 
and th then that would keep the meat in good condition until it got to the market. To, for, to get a commercial uh, operation, you would have had to have quite a number of fish to, to box that up and to get it moving because you could leave Ballyduff in the afternoon, uh, with uh, the fish could leave Ballyduff in the afternoon and then arrive in Billingsgate mid-morning on the following day. At its peak, railway transport links were the veins of the country. Rural towns and villages welcomed in guests looking to spend some of their earnings. And likewise the rail links allowed these villages and towns to monetize what they were producing. Tourism and businesses were created with help from the trains that were tooting in and out every day. Ballyduff, a once quiet sleepy village, found its legs. Before finding his home amongst the fishing community in Ballyduff, Ian Powell's life was one of contradictions, twists and turns. Leaving behind his budding musical career in Wales, he travelled to France as an industrial chemist, before realising his dream in the quiet confines of the old Ballyduff railway station. Ian takes us back to where it all began, the heyday of the 1960s and psychedelic rock. From my early teens, I taught myself to play guitar and then I was in the school band and then I was in local rock bands and we became quite quite successful. We were very, very well known, well, various bands, various forms, but uh, became quite well known on the rock and roll scene in South, in South Wales. We used to play support band to lots and lots of acts now, I mean... We play, you know, we were warm-up band for Bee Gees, Pink Floyd, Fleetwood Mac, Black Sabbath. There was a whole host of people that we appeared with, you know. Cross between heavy metal, psychedelic, Hendrixy sort of, you know, real wild stuff. Throw the guitars around a bit and all this kind of thing, you know, a bit like the Who. We used to do our own homemade light pyrotechnic sort of sort of a show. We must have been the first people ever to have a machine that blew bubbles because we made a little machine with a, a washing machine motor and lots of little uh, arms going out with circles on the end and a little plastic bath in the front. And when you turned the motor on, this thing turned around and we had a hairdryer attached to it, uh, which blew through the rings. So it blew this. It was very, it was very good. I mean, at the time, it was extremely efficient, and it, and it would blow blow streams of bubbles out, and we would have it up on the PA system out the front. But even rooted in this ever-changing lifestyle of flashing lights and electronic sounds. Ian's fishing dream remained constant. When I was playing in the band, uh, like all young musicians like that, uh, I had dreams of stardom. I was going to be a rock and roll millionaire and I was going to buy a castle in Scotland with thousands of acres of grouse moors and five miles of a, an idyllic salmon river wending its way past the castle. Uh, so that was going to be my future, you see, and time slowly crept on and nothing kind of happened. Off stage, he worked as an industrial chemist, passing extremely difficult exams with ease and began moving up the ranks quickly. 
I worked for BP Chemicals in in uh, South Wales uh, as a research assistant uh, in their polymer division. Um, and I would go out and play at night and then go to work in the morning and do my best to look as if I was wide awake. But uh, but I loved my job. I, mean, I really enjoyed my job. And like most things, I put, you know, absolute maximum effort into what I used to do. With Opportunity for Promotion Limited in Cardiff, Ian began looking elsewhere for employment. Before long, he was offered a job in Strasbourg, France. One fine day... I was in work and I got a phone call. We'd like you in Strasbourg by Thursday for an interview. At the time, I was playing gigging five, six nights a week. Having great fun, living the life, parties. I owned my own house already when I, when I was that age. I had absolutely no interest. So uh, I thought, hmm, about all expenses paid trip to over to Strasbourg you know first class tickets and everything to travel so I thought why not I'll do it but no interest at all so I went o- I went over and at the end of the interview he said okay that's perfect you're ideal for the job if you go if you go over to the personnel department they'll discuss the contract with you so anyway I went over to talk to the personnel director they offered me a starting salary which was three and a half times what I was earning in the job I was currently in so I decided I was going to turn my back on the things that I was doing at the time but I never lost that thought that ultimately I wanted to be fishing for the rest of my life. Now, I'd thought that I was going to own vast estate in Scotland and fishing and all that kind of thing. Uh, But I'd come to the realisation that that wasn't going to happen. And eventually I came to the conclusion that the best way to realise my dream would probably be to own a fishing hotel and that I could then spend the rest of my life fishing i always had this thing in my head about i wanted i you know the fishing hotel was my ultimate goal if you like to the extent that when that i had a book uh, which was called how to buy your own hotel and this was always in my briefcase so whenever i was traveling or anything like that i would be studying this and looking at case scenarios learning how you know, what what was involved in running a hotel. Along with educating himself in the hotel trade, Ian made a point of keeping up to date with what was happening in the fishing world. Wherever he travelled for work, he had a copy of Trout and Salmon under his arm. The more he read, the more familiar he became with different fishing haunts and spots across Ireland and the UK. But one little Waterford village crept up time and again. I was a subscriber to Trout and Salmon and uh, when I got my copy of Trout and Salmon, I would devour it from cover to cover. Then there was two things I looked at particularly. Uh, One was the fishing reports and the other one was the classified advertisements for fishing and businesses and things like that. The owner of the hotel used to put in reports for the black water in trout and salmon and I was very taken by them I couldn't explain to you why I had an interest in it but I used to follow it all the time I always had in my head the black water that's it for part one of the railway fishery the radio documentary that I made two years ago on the Blackwater lodge salmon fishery coming up in part two next week you'll hear from Glenda Powell and how she came to fish the black water and how fly fishing became such an integral and important part of her life. I hope you enjoyed part one and uh, do stay tuned for part two next week. And don't forget to subscribe, rate and review to the Ireland on the Fly podcast. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Until then, tight lines and I hope you get out in the water.